This is a conversation with the legendary comedy producer John Lloyd. John is a fixture of the British comedy scene. He created Not the Nine O'Clock News, he produced Spitting Image, and he also produced all four series of Blackadder. He's a deep thinker and a very wise man, and this conversation covered everything from comedy to the nature of creativity to the meaning of life. So it's definitely not about you, the universe, we're, but yet we all think it is. We think we're the center of the sat nav, don't we? That, that why is it not doing what I want it to? Why is it not giving me things? Yeah, because it's not about you. But yet the paradox is it's all about you. There is, you only got one job. You had just one job. You turn up here as a baby. You're supposed to fix yourself, mate. That's what you're meant to do. You only had to blow the bloody doors off. You know, that's the thing. And so the, the other side of it is it's all about you. And a, a very good way to live is to think you are the only actor in the drama. If you don't do it properly, it's all going to go to, you know, go to pieces. John was also good friends, roommates and co-author with Douglas Adams, the creator of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But there's an interesting thing about Hitchhiker. It asks all the big questions. I mean, almost as many big questions as Plato. They're all hidden in there, but it doesn't have any of the answers because we were only, you know, 25 or something and we didn't know what they were. We hadn't studied them, you know. We weren't, Plato lived to be 80, had plenty of time to think what are the answers and came up with a good few of them. So that's the thing, the answer to life, the universe, <laughs> anything is like, what's the answer to life, the universe and anything and everything, 42? Why? Because you're asking the wrong question. The answer to what the right question, it will be 42, but you haven't asked the right question. So everything, it starts brilliantly, asks the questions and then ends in a joke. And the question is, had Douglas lived to be my age, would he have discovered the answers? And I think there's a very good chance that he would have done. And most recently, he's the creator of the long running TV show QI, or Quite Interesting which is a combination of comedy and learning, and the creation of which John sees as a metaphor for life. To be a good QI researcher, to uncover the secrets of how a two-toed sloth works, or, you know, uh, what symphonies Beethoven used a triangle in, or what, whatever it is you're looking for, is you have to espouse the Christian virtues. You have to be patient, you have to be brave, you have to be kind, you have to be forgiving, because, lazy, greedy, angry people never find any of the stuff. It's the way in because mm. you still yourself, fix yourself and the universe will unfold in front of you in, in its already perfect state. Mm. And we're all, all the way, particularly in the West, I think we're schooled is you've got to try harder, fix it, you know, move it, you know, fight more, you know, stand up for yourself, you know, don't, nothing wrong with being angry. No, no, all this thing is horseshit. It's, the thing is, fix yourself, learn to be calm and be in the moment, be in the here and now and everything will be fine. It's fine. The universe is fine without you. John's a unique and fascinating guy. He's a good friend and I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. John. David. So, yeah, we've been talking offline for a, a long time and thought we'd record something and see where the conversation goes. Okay. Um, and if we can recreate some of the aliveness and interest that we've been able to find kind of in our offline conversations, then it'll be worth sharing with the world and <laughs> see where it goes. Um, so you're kind of a legend of British comedy. Would you say that? Is that fair? Well, uh, uh, it's not for me to say, honestly, but I've been doing it a long time and I've had a few hits, yeah. We first connected at the Wilderness Festival a few years ago and I was watching the forum, the kind of ideas space, and you were in a panel discussion, I think, and you were talking and I was, I was just struck by, I, I thought, here is a man, you were talking about consciousness, you were talking about spirituality, basically, which... I wouldn't have necessarily expected with your background and your interests. It was a thing about artificial intelligence, I think, wasn't it? A panel about that. Yeah. Could have been, but you were coming from a, from a very, there were a lot of overlaps with the stuff that I was really interested yeah. in, um, kind of some of the same reference points. And um, yeah, we sort of spellbound, we connected afterwards, we, we talked and found a lot of really sh interesting shared interests. 
Um, and yeah, do you want to talk about w when you first became interested in this broader space and then we'll kind of riff off maybe some of our shared interests? Well, uh, anybody who knows anything about me knows that I had a midlife crisis in my early 40s where I completely lost the plot, I lost any sense of meaning and it was particularly ludicrous because I had everything. I had a my office at home was covered in awards and I had plenty of money. I was shooting ads at the time, I had kids, I had a really nice flat in London, a tiny little cottage in the country, you know, and I thought this I really was really pissed off to be so angry when I couldn't see what I had to be angry about. A few bad things had gone wrong in work, a few betrayals, that kind of stuff that had been hurtful. But essentially, I woke up on Christmas Eve 1993, age 42, and thought, I can't see the point of anything. What's the point of me being here? So I was very unhappy for two or three years, desperate really, um, and furious and very resentful for all the things that had happened to me. And I thought, well, I've got to dig myself out of it. it clearly, I'm the problem here. I need to, like a program, I'm a, I'm a, a problem solver in programming. You say, okay, there's a problem here. People, no, there isn't. Yes, there is. We need to fix this thing here. So I thought, I've got to f find out what's wrong and essentially is there a is there a better way of being than he who dies of the most toys wins because I seem to have won the toys as far as I wasn't a millionaire or anything but you know enough and so I set out to look for the meaning of life quite literally so I thought well well actually I started with art I thought I I'm ignorant and talentless I don't know anything I don't even know you know about photography and I'm a, a well-paid commercial strikes. So I bought loads of books on photography because you could. In those days, you paid a lot of money to shoot beer ads or whatever and art books. And and then I can't remember. I was reading a, um, a book called The Agony and the Ecstasy about the life of Michelangelo, which is a brilliant uh, uh, book. And I came across um, a guy called Pico della de Mirandola, who was one of um, Lorenzo de Medici's uh, advisors, and what he was trying to do was bring a sort of bring the Renaissance to the fore and discover, rediscover ancient Greek and Roman learning and all that kind of thing. And in the book, it talks about how this tiny little place, Athens, about one hundred and fifty thousand citizens, probably over a period of you know a couple of hundred years, discovered everything. You know, from philosophy, coinage, um, a, a drama, um, a democracy, you, you name it. This, this list is ridiculously long. So I thought, I'd never even heard of this. I mean, I knew the Greeks were smart and everything and, you know, did a bit of Greek at school. But So I went to uh, Foils in the Charing Cross Road thinking I'm... <laughs> I know something that these people don't know. I'm pretty smart. And so I went up to the sixth floor of the classics department and I said to the hippie behind the desk, um, do you have any books on 5th uh, or 6th uh, century um, Athens, BC? And he goes, yeah. And he pointed at a wall, and there was a wall like 15 feet high and 30 feet long, which was just books on Athens in the 5th and 6th centuries BC. And that was really what started me off, because I thought, in 10 lifetimes I couldn't read all those. That's how ignorant I am about one town in Greece in 200 years and I knew nothing about it except that it was there. So then the next crisis was as somebody's always thought they were, I don't think I'm a genius or anything, but you know, I used to get good grades at school and I went to Cambridge University. I got a very bad third, but I nonetheless, you know, I used to do be good at quizzes and things. I thought I, I read a lot of books and I had this sudden attack that I didn't know anything at all. I didn't know, how does an atom work? I've never bothered to find out. I was shit at science at school, you know. I know nothing at all. And I remember sitting, getting very depressed. I was sitting on a park bench in, in the wrong end of Fulham High Street by the bridge and looking at a pigeon, thinking, oh my God, look at that thing. I've never looked at a pigeon before in my life and all the different colors on its head and its little walk and its little beady eyes. You think, this is extraordinary. So then it... It, so that ignorance thing that was a horrible shock to think, you know, you don't know anything. So I've got to find out quickly. And I had this really interesting but weird life for about 10 years. So I'd go off around the world shooting lager ads and cheese and, 
you know, Barclay card ads and all that kind of thing. And in the evenings, I'd rush home and read Heidegger and, you know, Sartre and uh, Epicurus, you know, didn't matter really, just to find out is there, who's got the secret? Who's got the way of being which, which is not delivering for me because I'm not happy. And I'm, I'm obviously also painfully aware that apart from shooting cheese ads, which I was very good at, Everything else in my life was completely incompetent. I was a hopeless father because I was so absent. And if I was present, I was often cross and, you know, not a very good, um, not a very good husband because I was distracted and self-obsessed. And, you know, as soon as I could, I'd get to my office and open a bottle of scotch and start reading physics or anthropology or archaeology. It didn't matter what it was, just to... you know, so it was a huge, huge adventure for me. And um, I consider that crisis the best thing that's ever happened to me because after the first three years, which were just misery, I started thinking for myself and reading so widely and connecting things up and asking the questions, you know, why are we here? That was the thing. I didn't want to wake up on my deathbed thinking, so what was that all about? I wanted to be there a long time before thinking there's a way of living which is optimal, which is good for me and hopefully good for other people as well. So it all stemmed out of a crisis and it's one of the absolute um, cornerstones of my philosophy. Disaster is a gift, you know, if you can only look back on your life as we so often do. 20 years later you look back and think, Oh, thank goodness I was fired from that job. I hated it. Um, yeah, so I didn't even ask your questions. I just wandered off in a different mm. direction. It was a great journey. <laughs> <laughs> um, and where would you say you've ended up uh, at the end of that? You said you sort of had a three-year process. And where, where are you at now with, with that? Well, we're talking, you know, close on 30 years ago that happened. And I'm a... I'm, I'm, I consider myself unbelievably fortunate, and I'm very grateful that I had to go through that process. But as my son Harry says, nobody ever learned anything from being successful. You just, you know, particularly one of the ideas you learn from being successful is you think you know. I'm the best stand-up comedian in the world. You know, I'm the world's finest, whatever, racing driver, painter, builder. And that's very bad for you because you need to know how ignorant you are. And going back to Athens and Socrates, I don't know if you know the famous story about Socrates and the Oracle. Uh, Where the Oracle said that he was the most, he was the smartest man in Athens. He was the wisest man in Athens, yeah. Because he knew that he knew nothing. That's right. Hmm. So there's a really interesting thing. This is the thing about, it's a very interesting thing when you start thinking for yourself, and it's a privilege to to be able to look at everything that people accept. They accept, well, this is obviously true. Everybody knows that, you know, they're called axioms in Greek philosophy, you know, or in mathematics. It's an absolute, this is, this is something we, nobody can disagree with. That, that isn't true of anything, unfortunately. Even in mathematics, which is the only human construct, really, where we can say these are definitely right. This is definitely correct. Two plus two equals four. We know that, uh-uh. not in non-Euclidean, mathematics, you know, not in the, the, the maths that you need um, to build an atomic bomb, for example, says that parallel lines do meet. You think, but but that, by definition, parallel lines don't meet. Oh, yeah, but they do in this geometry. And actually, when you think about this, it's always when you find a paradox or something so counterintuitive that it must be wrong that you're on the right path. So I started thinking about this and think, when do parallel lines meet? Well, easy, you know, two latitudes, which ones are the longitudes, I can't remember which goes up, they're parallel, but they both meet at the North Pole. So that is non-Euclidean geometry isn't truer than Euclid's geometry, which is basically just drawings. There aren't any squares in nature. There aren't any triangles. I think there are probably some circles, but that's about it. So... There's a thing about ignorance is that it's a paradox because good ignorance is I know that I know nothing and so I'm modest, I don't claim to know anything, I'm very interested in what you have to say because I don't know, which is I'm the professor of ignorance at Southampton Central University as you may know and 
it's now the journey for me to go from I'm really ashamed that I don't know anything to think I'm so pleased I don't know anything because I don't have to compete anymore. I don't have to be right. I don't have to win things. I can just enjoy the conversation. And of course, be, sometimes be amused about how other people, how ignorant other people are, but they don't know it yet. And I hope that they will come to know that. Mm. And because there's bad ignorance too, which is the people who are so ignorant that they think they're right all the time, and then they want to kill people, and that's not good. Mm. Yeah, it reminds me of a of a Osho quote, which is, "Not knowing is the most intimate." Well, there are all those lines, aren't there? You know. The person who knows they do not know has begun to know. That's the thing, is the baseline of becoming is to realize you're ignorant. It's rather like in AA, um, the first thing, you won't get anywhere unless you admit there's a higher power. If, I don't care how and that you, keen you are to give up drinking. you can't do it yourself. You can't. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so the ignorance thing is... It, and it all shades into QI, you know, yeah, because... And I've, I've, I've experienced that myself with a family member in particular, um, about the uh, the truth of that statement with AA, is that as long as the ego thinks it's in charge, been through this, kind of like step one in the 12 steps is, I am not able to control this. Because as soon as the, as long as the ego thinks it's in charge, it's a sort of pride, I can cope with this. And it's only in realizing actually, I can't, that you open up the possibility for, for healing. In uh, the States, the AA is, uh, you can put it down as your religion if you want. It's considered to be a religious thing. And, and again, religion's one of those things that gets a bad uh, rap, doesn't it? It's like, oh, because that's the terrorist thing, or it's, uh, you know, there's all the people who believe in fairies and all that stuff. But actually what religion is, is just simply a way of looking at the world, which is as valid as science, I would say, or comedy is another very good way of looking. Well, music is an excellent way of, of interpreting the world and obviously I specialize in comedy, but because the, the, the problem is that science can't or won't refuse. Science either can't or refuses to look at certain questions such as why is there something and not nothing. I know a famous chemist a professor at Oxford who I'm not going to name who got furious about that. He said, I think those questions should be illegal. You can't ask why is there something and not nothing. I said, why not? I just have. It's a perfectly fair question. He says, yeah, but that's, it's not scientific. It's not a scientific question. I said, I don't care. It's an interesting question. And these things about the ego, for example, you know, I didn't know that. I don't know much about AA. I've been to one meeting with a friend because he asked me to go, but I don't know much about it. But egotism is another thing. It's like... When I was young and ambitious, you think, that was my idea. I wrote that. I did that. And now I haven't taken an, a credit for an idea for probably 25 years, maybe 30. You think, because it's another mystery. Nobody knows where ideas come from. I remember doing a thing with Paul Davis, the great Anglo-Australian physicist, who's a genius scientist. And I said to him on one of our meetings, where do ideas come from? He said, I never, I never understand that. When I'm doing the crossword and it just pops into my head, it's amazing, isn't it? Which it is. And the thing is, you get so much farther if you think, these are not my ideas. These ideas, somebody said ideas are like fish floating past, you know. And all that a, a creative person can take credit for, I think, is A, effort, is doing it when it's painful and desperate and you don't want to do it and you're not getting it and you go on beyond the pain barrier you know like a marathon runner there's that barrier and then suddenly you're in the zone and the other thing is stop thinking that your ideas they're like you are somehow I absolutely believe this that ideas are channeling you're channeling them from a from a higher source in the way that say my son Harry who's a musician and a songwriter like many songwriters who know what they're doing and he writes very good tunes he doesn't take credit for writing them. He takes credit for making the effort to sit down when he doesn't want to. And it comes. You know, Noel Gallagher famously said that on Desert Island Dis, there's a man in, in the sky with a bucket and he just pours tunes into my head. Mozart said, I've never composed a note. I merely listen to God. And that's what Mozart used to do. He'd go out to dinner, have a few drinks, sit mm. down at the spinet, and it would just pour out of him didn't sort of sit down going, I wonder what comes next. It just comes. 
And, and of course, once the ego isn't present, the little guy in your head going, I'm great, I'm amazing, something happens where you become attuned to what is available, the much bigger thing, the sort of super conscious, if you like. Um, but you also get the, it work, can work the other way where you may have that creative flow with your, like the famous like second album syndrome with, with music, where you're in that state of flow for the first album, you become successful, and then then the ego comes in. Then the then you kind of yeah. you, you start believing your own hype. You start believing your own press. That's why the second and then it and then it and then that starts becoming that kind of belief structure or that kind of ego structure that you build up then becomes a block for whatever needs to come next. Well, you know the you know dire straits is called that because they were so desperate that they called them so they had nothing. They weren't going to get anywhere, and you know because I'm slightly involved in Harry's career in the music business, those stories are legion. You know, there's not a band ever who, who suddenly was successful overnight. It doesn't happen. Or, you know, people have been at it for 10 years or 20 or, or they never get there. And so what happens is it's like with comics, you know, comics, young, angry, gifted, got a story to tell that's really eating them up and, and it's coming out direct from the truth of their own life and it's marvelous. And then they have a huge hit and they get a Ferrari addiction and the, they start, they're not telling the truth anymore because they think they know what they're doing. They think, you know, they think they're good. You should never think you're good. You know, it's, you just think, I'm, it's, it's, for me, every job is as difficult as, you know, all the others. It doesn't get any easier. It's just hard work and diligence and waiting for the muse to strike, you know. It's, so when you're talking about these strangeness is the business of being in the zone you know when people say oh homeopathy what bullshit you know it could be just the placebo effect i say and and the placebo effect one of the most peculiar mysteries of existence but you can explain that can you well no, no nobody nobody can explain that well then don't diss what other people that's what qi research teaches you it doesn't matter what you're researching and how many books you've read about it, you will always find, if you're doing the job properly, something you didn't know. And very often it's something completely counterintuitive that destroys a thing that you were certain of. It's, it's so intriguing and of course it is ultimately and very quickly mysterious because you get down to a sort of bedrock where nobody knows that. Why is there something and not nothing? Even with the Big Bang, the whole science is you get it down to just a minuscule nanosecond of a nanosecond and a teeny weeny thing, but you can't go beyond that. The maths doesn't allow it. It, it ju just stops working. So you're left with the mysteries. Why is there something here at all? And that is true of anything you can think of. So um, one of the things I used to amuse me greatly when I started getting interested in things, leaves, okay? When you're a, a, a dad, and your child comes to you and they say, look, daddy, a leaf. And you go, for Christ's sake, yeah, a leaf. We've all seen leaf. We all know what a leaf is. You don't know. Nobody knows what a leaf is. It's the most amazing engine in nature. So there's a great QI fact, which is every day, the leaves of the world create more energy from water and sunlight than the human race has consumed in its entire existence times six. So if you think of all the warships and all the steam engines and all the windmills and the water mills going back, you know, 50,000, 100,000 years, however long you date it back to, leaves are doing six times that every day, just leaves. Well, people say, well, that's photosynthesis. Yeah. And how? How did that get there? You know, and it, so these things... Um, First of all, that the mystery is at the core of everything. You can't, you can't dig, you always get to the, what I call a terminal why. Okay, that's, so it's because, um, again, sorry to use Harry as an example, but my kids have taught me everything I know. You know, they, by asking the, what appear to be damn fool questions, and you think, why? Well, oh, does God look after burglars? Mm, that's a big moral question, I don't know. And so Harry once said to me, we're, we're, it's an old story, but um, I'm taking him to school. He's about three, go to nursery school, a little tiny lad. And he says, Dad, who's that, uh, who's that guy over there? Which guy? 
the guy getting into the car. I don't know, now he's just some guy I don't know him. He's probably, he probably lives in the street. Now he says, well, why is he getting in the car, Dad? Well, it's uh, probably he's going to work, I think. Why is he going to work, Dad? <sighs> well, you know, probably because, uh, well, he has to go to work to earn money, you know, Harry. And uh, Harry says, uh, why do you have to earn money, Dad? Christ almighty. Well, listen, Harry, if you don't earn money, if he doesn't earn money, his wife and children will all die. Do you understand? And he goes, Dad, yes. Why do things want to live? I mean, that is a big question, isn't it, for a three-year-old? And they all do it. All three-year-olds ask those kind of questions, and we don't pay attention to them. So, um, yeah. Mm. So the, the thing is, the business of ignorance and, uh, and mystery and why strings, the, the more I go on, the less I know. And it's very comforting, So, because I don't have to know anything. But what is, is a good thing is if you're living a life which is worth living. That's, a, that's the thing. And, uh, and that is, I, I think, is what we're here for, to try to learn that, how to do it. And is there a paradox in... You're talking about the value of ignorance, but your now kind of business day job is QI, which maybe we should explain for maybe the American yeah. viewers who, who aren't familiar with it. But that's all about knowing, all about finding out. It's not about knowing. It's about because this is the thing about... Science. So what is QI? Let's start with that. Okay. Maybe. So QI stands for quite interesting, and it is a game show essentially about interesting information of high-low culture. So it might be about frogs or daffodils or, uh, I don't know, George Washington or uh, uh, atomic physics, it doesn't matter. Um, and the idea behind QI is that everything in the universe without exception is interesting if looked at long enough, close enough, or from the right angle. Now, that doesn't chime with our experience of real life because we know we love football and I'm very interested in that and I'm very good at corporate banking which I do well, but that's it. The other stuff is, I don't do science, I'm not a scientist, I don't know. It's always a shock to me when I say to people, do you know my wife doesn't know whether the sun goes around the moon or whether it's the earth goes around the, you know. And they, sometimes these sort of 55 year old senior chief executives go, um, yeah, well they probably do know that actually, but they don't know the difference between a planet and a star they don't know the difference between an atom and a molecule, which I didn't know at 42 either. So fair dues, but we don't. So the thing is, people think they're not ignorant because there are two or three areas of expertise where they really know, and the other stuff they don't need to know, so it doesn't matter. But what QI does is it shows you that everything you thought you knew, or nearly all of it, is not true, or only partly true. But of course, it changes over time. There's a very interesting book called The Half-Life of Facts, written by a guy, I think, at Stanford University, um, which is um, like an, you know, atomic um, radioactive materials decay, and that's the, the, the number of times it takes, a the time it takes to decay half the amount is called the half-life. So medical students, for example, now are taught that within, I think it's 10 years, half of the things you learn will be outdated. So that's the half-life of, of medicine is 10 years, or is it five years, I don't know. But, and, and so in all these, it's true of all sciences except maths, which um, basically is a, has a very, very long half-life. We very, very rarely find that a, something that was proven or thought to be proven is, is no longer true. But in physics and in genetics and in anthropology, it's changing every single day, you know. When I started QI in, when it started, ooh, 2002, something like that, there were 4,300 and something species of frogs in the world. They've now discovered, I think, nearly twice that, just the frogs. So there's a lot of, everything's changing all the time. So QI is not about the right answer, it's about the most interesting answer and the truest answer we can find for the time being, really. And you're sort of almost framing it as a... Um spiritual pursuit like there is something i really find like when i'm in a when i'm tuned in or when i'm feeling kind of in a, in a good place i'm interested in lots of different things and when i'm not i'm i'm very 
limited in my interest. It's sort of like very few things that kind of, and that's that, that's what happens with with depression. That's what happens with yeah. Uh, kind I, of I was depressed for many years. I didn't take meds because I thought I was correct. I was depressed because I'd been very badly treated, and I was right. I was absolutely certain it was everybody else's fault. And it's only when you start thinking, well, it might be something to do with you. Because depression, not to dis, because I've been there and I can say how, how dreadful it is and how much one suffers, but it's a form of, you know, it's a form of egotistical um, Ferris wheel. You go round and round and round and all uh, people who are depressed never want to go out, so they don't have any contact with people, so the, the thing becomes more and more toxic in physics. Um, the principle is entropy disorder tends to increase in a closed system. That's law one of the universe. I think it's the second law of thermodynamics. So one of the things that people are ignorant about is they think there's any one of them. You know, I mean, they know there are people with multiple personality disorder, but I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm me. I know what I, you know, I think, and I'm me. And that's a disaster because they're in, there's two of you in there. There's the little yappy guy who's going on. Yeah, why is he going on about this? Why is he? I didn't ask him this question at all. I can hear your 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 little man inside is going. This interview is going really badly, and uh, he's got to be away by four thirty. And I wish I hadn't started it. All those the the, the voice in your head, you know. <clears throat> in the days when it was there was no political correctness, it was all right to laugh about people who had voices in their heads. We thought it was funny, but of course we all have that. And as a crazy person, you'll know this, is when you're in the zone, when you're really working properly, when you're really, um, whatever it is, I like to draw, I lose myself in drawing. Hours go by and suddenly, God, 6.30, I've missed the thing. Um, actors get it, that they become the person they're playing and their own personality is, isn't there anymore. And I sometimes say, you're most yourself when you're not there. I used to get as a film director, when I mean, literally 10 hours ago, but I hadn't thought about myself at all. And so, you know, all these mistaken ideas, like it's the me generation, I deserve this, and you know, it's all about me, it's not about you at all. It, it's all the only thing it's about you about is fix yourself. That's your job here. Stop moaning about everybody else's fault. It's always somebody else's fault and so on. So that's what meditation does. As you know, when you're meditating, you're trying to still the monkey mind. You're trying to just be, to be conscious without thinking. And it's a very difficult thing to explain that to people who haven't tried it. But conscious without thinking, for example, is when you're driving down a motorway and you suddenly realize you've passed eight exits and you hadn't even thought about it, you know. Driving's a very meditative thing. And the interesting thing about QI research, it's the same because you're so, you're trying to find this thing about, let's say, what was I doing the other day? Underwood's long-tongued bat. Yeah, I never heard of this thing before, but it begins with U. Each, each series begins with a different letter of the alphabet, subject-wise. And it's very hard to find the information. And uh, so for three hours while you're doing this, you don't think about yourself at all. You're completely absorbed in otherness, you know. And this connects with, for example, you want to be happy? Help somebody else. Stop going on about how you want to be happy. It's it, all the literature says, you know, it's why, you know, religious people, caring people live longer by and large because they are looking out for other people. Um, and there's a funny thing. I, QI isn't, doesn't claim to be anything sp spiritual. As I was saying to you earlier, I wish I had started the new Scientology that wasn't in any way toxic because I would not be sitting here talking to you, David. I'd be on my yacht off Sardinia. Because the <coughs> peculiar accident of this really simple principle, everything's interesting. Well, I couldn't find anything interesting. You haven't looked long enough. Keep going. Gooseberries, you'll find something about, you know, butterflies. There's tons about butterflies. Obviously, everyone knows they're interesting. But maybe not this particular table, but oh yes there is, there's always something. Um, and you have this peculiar thing is you, all researchers when they start, they kind of, first of all the first hour and a half there's nothing at all and they think they're stupid. 
and they already got a first from Oxford, let's say. Not all, some have never been to university, but they think they're good, and then they find this is much more difficult than I thought. And then if you're lucky, after about three hours, you start discovering ways into finding the information, and then suddenly you're swamped by it. There's 80 books on gooseberries, you know. You, you're never going to be able to cover gooseberries properly, and no matter how in detail you do them, you'll always miss something. But the process of it, the process of doing the work, is a practice, as, as you guys would say, and well, I would say, as somebody who does yoga, it's a practice which is good for you because it's stilling the mind, it's making you think about things other than yourself, which is, again, what people who are depressed don't do. They only think about themselves. And the, the more a depressed person thinks about themselves, the worse it gets. Um, so the, the, the QI thing is... I was, um, a few years ago, I shared a platform with Rome Williams, the ex-Archbishop of Canterbury. It was a conference in Cambridge, and uh, I can't remember why we'd been put there together, but we would, had a chat about stuff. And I was saying, I'm, I'm not conventionally religious in any sense. I don't go to church even. Um, I'm not Buddhist, uh, but I'm really interested in all these things. And you meet a person like Rowan, who's an extraordinary man, unbelievably clever and very, very nice. And I just said spontaneously, it was the first time I really thought about it, it was very odd that to be a good QI researcher, to uncover the secrets of how a two-toed sloth works or, you know, uh, what symphonies Beethoven used a triangle in or whatever it is you're looking for, is you have to espouse the Christian virtues. You have to be patient, you have to be brave, you have to be kind, you have to be forgiving, because lazy, greedy, angry people never find any of the stuff. It's the way in, because mm -hmm. you still yourself, fix yourself, and the universe will unfold in front of you in, in its already perfect state. And we're all, all the way, particularly in the West, I think we're schooled is you've got to try harder, fix it, you know, move it, uh, tr you know, fight more, you know, stand up for yourself, you know, uh, don't, nothing wrong with being angry. No, no, all this thing is horseshit. It's, the thing is, fix yourself, learn to be calm and be in the moment, be in the here and now and everything will be fine. It's fine. The universe is fine without you. Yeah, there's a lot, I know you're familiar with Alan Watts. Yeah. I'm very uh, keen on Alan Watts's thought. Mm. One thing that came up as you were speaking as well about I love the paradox of um, we're more ourselves the less we think about ourselves. Yeah. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of G.K. Chesterton's uh, famous quote, the reason angels can fly is that they take themselves so lightly. <laughs> um, along with many other great G.K. Chesterton quotes. But um, yeah, the, I, 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 lo I love that idea. But in, in a way, there's maybe something as well about if one goes into anything far enough, one ends up in the same kind of place. That there's a there's a there's a dimension, there's a spiritual dimension even to a game show like QI. I think that's true. There's I one of the central paradoxes of existence is there one thing or many things, and the answer is both or neither. That's the core to me. That's as me to and me. neither or or neither neither and or both and or neither probably. I had a great friend who is an architect, a uh, great friend of Douglas Adams as well, who died tragically of a heart attack at 40. And Ricky and I used to talk all the time about how similar it is putting a building up and making a television program. The mm. basic principles are the same. You know, somebody once said, all the great aphorists, you know, the writers of maxims throughout history, all sound as if they knew each other rather well. Because a a maxim from Plato or Lichtenberg or, you know, Oscar Wilde or Alan Bennett is... You mentioned Douglas Adams, yeah. um, and obviously he was a very good friend of yours, uh, the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is probably one of the, the most influential books on the kind of the big questions of the meaning of life, uh, the answer to the meaning of life, obviously being 42. and. Yeah, I'd love to, to hear a little bit about, because you also co-wrote a book together, The Meaning of Lif. Um, how, how was that um, at the time, and what was, what was the nature of that 
relationship? Well, Douglas and I, were, we got to know each other just after coming down from US. I knew him slightly, uh, but we were more rivals at college because he was in a different college. We were both trying to do funny things on stage. But we got to be very good friends when he came down and we had the most amazing few years. We uh, used to write a lot together and uh, talk a lot together and go to Tootsie's, the hamburger joint, and have too much wine and talk about life and the universe and all that kind of stuff. And he... He, he was never, Douglas a genius, but like many geniuses, not particularly competent at normal things, you know. Um, and so he got really stuck. His career wasn't really going anywhere. I was doing quite well as a radio producer. And he was thinking of quitting, actually, the week before he got uh, the commission for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the pilot. And um, he was going to become a shipbroker in Hong Kong. He'd had enough. It's not going to work. Which is another great principle is always go the distance. Don't you know? Don't give up too soon. That's definitely a thing that we're not really taught at school. Um, anyway, he got the he got the commission. He he was a very slow writer. He got stuck after four episodes and asked me if I'd help. So I did. Because um, just for maybe people who are familiar with the books, yeah. the Hitchhiker's Guide was actually started. A BBC a, it was a series. BBC radio series. Yeah, six yeah. six shows. He got stuck. Uh, just after finishing the fourth one. And so as we were best friends and we'd shared houses and flats together and uh, um, yeah, it was a pleasure. So we knocked that off in a few weeks. It was great. And then to everyone's astonishment, the series became a massive hit just overnight. It was literally an overnight hit. Well, he put in five years work to make it that good. Um, and then um, it, lots of publishers were after us and then after the sixth publisher had taken us out to lunch, Douglas wrote me a note and fired me, basically. But, you know, it's fine. It's great. Uh, I'm, since then, I was very unhappy at the time, but since then, best thing that ever happened to me because it kick-started me into thinking I've got to do things for myself. But there's an interesting thing about Hitchhiker. It asks all the big questions. I mean, almost as many big questions as Plato. They're all hidden in there. But it doesn't have any of the answers because we were only, you know, 25 or something and we didn't know what they were. We hadn't studied them, you know. We Plato lived to be 80, had plenty of time to think what are the answers and came up with a good few of them. So that's the thing, the answer to life, the universe, <laughs> anything is like, what's the answer to life, the universe and anything and everything? 42. Why? Because you're asking the wrong question. The answer to what the right question, it will be 42, but you haven't asked the right question. So everything, it starts brilliantly, asks the questions, and then ends in a joke. And the question is, had Douglas lived to be my age, would he have discovered the answers? And I think there's a very good chance that he would have done. Um, because there's a <laughs> famous story about Richard Curtis, the writer of Blackadder, and a good friend of both of us. And Four Weddings and a Funeral, and uh, you know, Notting Hill, all those great movies. He was um, decided to go out for lunch with Douglas. Um, and they decided to go and have a good boozy lunch, and a bit of gossip, you know, a few laughs. And on the way to this lunch, Douglas said in his slightly agonized way, he said, suddenly got terribly serious, and he said, uh, you know, Richard said, how are you, Douglas? And Douglas said, well, you know, I'm a bit... Diff I'm in an odd place at the moment, Richard, because I think I've actually discovered what the meaning of life, the universe, and everything actually is. And Richard's... The man in Richard's head going, right, OK, I've come to a fork in my life here. If I say to Douglas, my God, you've discovered the meaning of life, what is it? He won't stop talking for four hours and it'll be very serious. There'll be lots of physics in it and probably lots of computing analogies and Richard won't understand half of it. Uh, and they won't have their lovely gossipy lunch. Or he can just say about Douglas's then girlfriend, uh, oh really, you just got me in your life. And how's Jane? And Richard said to his eternal embarrassment and chagrin, he asked, oh really, and how's Jane? And so Douglas says, oh, well, you know, it's, it rubs along, I suppose. And so then they started laughing and they had lunch. And anyway, six months later, Douglas died. And Richard said he had, he had a thing, the way that Douglas was talking, that he was onto something. 
you know, and you sometimes hear these stories in science. I was kind of think scientist the other day who was who had a very similar thing. He phoned his wife and said, I think I've discovered what it's all about. And then he had a heart attack. Dangerous. So we'll never know. Because, I mean, Douglas was famously one of the sort of more, more prominent new atheists at the time, friends with Richard Dawkins. Yeah. Um, and you do, you do you think that he would have, because that's obviously not where you've ended up. You, you've ended up in a very different place to that. Um, how do you reflect on that now and that kind of trajectory and his his potential trajectory? Well, it's really odd. I, I mean, I haven't really changed my political views, for example, at all. I don't think I'm centrist. I'm in the middle and quite open minded. I think the thing I don't like about politics is not very creative. You don't often hear interesting new ideas until you say, you know, Finnish children don't have any homework. Well, how does that work? Well, what, how it works is they're all much more attentive at school because they've had a nice evening off and they all get much better results than almost any country in the world. Or the Portuguese who no, no uh, drugs are illegal in Portugal, no recreational drugs. Result, they have hardly any drug addicts. So those are good political ideas. But on religion, so Douglas was a Oddly enough, like Richard, they were both very religious teenagers, you know, altar boys and all that kind of stuff, and both became atheists along the line. And I've always been a kind of, well, how would that work then? So you you go to heaven and you meet your, how old are they, your parents, when you meet them? Well, you know, do, do we actually physically have bodies? You know, can you, can you bang your knee up there? Or that's, so I've always been broadly in an agnostic position, which I respect anyone as an agnostic, but what does it mean? It's somebody who doesn't know. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether there is or not. Is there a, is there a designer? I don't know. It certainly looks like it. But if you say it's an accident, I'm, I'm very prepared to entertain that. And the whole thing about this, you know, I know it's something you do a lot of and you're very interesting, this the way the world split into sort of binary things. It's either this or it's that, but it isn't. Aristotle used to say a thing cannot be both A and not A, but it can. Everything, in fact, is grey. Everything is in the middle. Nothing, everything is nuanced. Everything is much more complicated and much more interesting than you think. I know I've been doing that for 20 years. I, I cannot think of anything that is boring or simple. Everything's complex. Uh, and out of that comes, this is why you know, uh, often think, I wish I'd started a religion instead of uh, a silly panel game because it works. You know, there's only one, there's only one piece of liturgy, which is everything is interesting we looked at in the right way. It's never failed to deliver yet. And so the faith is continually, is, is reaffirmed, you know. Um, and also it has the effect of because of the way you have to work, of turning out nicer people. You would think if you were running, you were one of the senior researchers on, you know, the popular BBC programmes been running for 20 years and won lots of prizes, you'd be a bit of a cock. No, they're not. They're all modest. They're all, they're, you know, curious. They're interested in other people. They're friendly. They're, um, they've got very, they're stable people, they, you know, most people come to us a bit nerdy, to, to put it mildly, some of them are extremely geeky, but they, they fall into their skin because they're doing something which they believe in, where people love and trust and encourage them, and it's interesting every day, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Why aren't, all, why aren't all things like that? Do you know who Brunswick are? No. Big financial PR company. And Alan, who runs it, is an old friend, and he occasionally has these rather brilliant ideas that are off topic. And this is the idea of starting a day of the year where we can all remember the people we know who died and who we loved. There's no space for that for a secular person. For a religious person, you go to the church and light a candle or you lay wreath. But if, if, you're, if you're a secular person, there's no, it's such a shame as you go through, spool through your phone, all these names. Oh my God, he's dead, she's dead, this is terrible. I, haven't thought about them for two years, so it, it's rather nice. And so you heard of the temple at Burning Man? No. So you know Burning Man? Yeah, the festival. Festival in the desert. 
there's there's two major ceremonies at Burning Man. There's the burning of the man on the on the on the Saturday, and there's also something they call the temple, which is a kind of secular. So it's a big big structure, and during the the week, everyone goes there and they take mementos of people who've died or write the names of people who've died into the temple and you get kind of these really elaborate kind of tributes and then on the Sunday they burn the temple mm-hmm. um, and it's yeah I'm actually quite touched even thinking about yeah, it now yeah, like it's that. it's an extraordinary feeling being in there and seeing everyone like the, the feeling is so so kind of respectful it's sacred there's, there's no it's, it's it's secular like there's there's no kind of um, religious um, denomination, but it's such a an, it's such a touching experience going there, being there, writing someone's name, and then when on the Saturday when the man burns, it's a real sort of raucous carnival, Dionysian atmosphere. But then when on the Sunday when they burn the temple, it's vast crowd, and you can just you could hear a pin drop. It's just an extraordinary ritual um, that they've managed to crack something for a kind of secular audience when you mention words like sacred you know that one of the things that are inadequate about contemporary ways to express ourselves is words for things like that sacred religion spirituality all those things will frighten a lot of people off you know um, because it just sounds like what people would consider bullshit or it's fairy stuff or whatever but actually Surely everyone's had a meaningful experience, you know, where you think this is an epiphany, something's happened here, a sunset or a, 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 an amazing relationship or something with a child or where you think I've entered a different level of consciousness, where I, which is correct, if you like. This is more correct than the whingy, moany person that I normally have to live with. And you, you, you get into a, again, you're, you're back in the zone. And... And these terminologies are hopeless, even God, you know, when you say, well, do, do I believe in God? What, did, what do you mean? Tell me what you mean by God. Define God and I'll tell you whether I do or not. But one thing I can say is what I don't believe in is materialist nothing. You know, there's nothing here. Sometimes you hear people say, there's nothing here except atoms and genes. What do you mean except? An atom? You think that's nothing? A hydrogen atom is the simplest thing in the universe and the most abundant thing in the universe. And the structure of a hydrogen atom is extraordinary. I don't know if you know this, but somebody worked out through spectrographic analysis, a hydrogen atom has, I forget how many frequencies, I think it's 100 frequencies, something like that. So it's more complicated, one hydrogen atom, than a grand piano. And we think of it, oh, atoms, genes, and they don't even... They still don't understand how many genes are in the human genome. Did you know that? They just don't. Nobody does anything. We're told in the papers that the scientists will sort it out. So I thought it was about thirty thousand. It's less than that, I think. Um, when I started being interested in this twenty years ago, they assumed obviously that humans, are, you know, being superior, would have more genes than other things. Um, so they reckoned about a hundred thousand in the genome. It's, they've revised it downwards every year since, and it's now just over 20, I think. But they still haven't agreed on what the genes are. Yeah. But they can say for certain that rice has 33,000 genes, which is definitely more than we have. And ferns, forget the famous fern. There's one fern that's got, um, we've got 46 chromosomes, and this particular fern, the southern adder's tongue's fern, tongue, the southern adder's tongue fern, has 1,400 and something chromosomes. I mean, what? what is going on with a fern? Well, it, are you familiar with James Zafano? Yeah. Yeah, he wrote an amazing book called Why Us, yeah. where he went into this. He, he t- took on the kind of reductionist idea of genetics and neuroscience and basically said, we've completely misunderstood. Like, we cannot explain the complexity of humanity through genes. And that's based on a kind of materialist idea of like, well, it must be particular building blocks that are making us what we are. But the more we understand about genes, the more we realize that that's not how it's working. Like there's, there's a much more complex picture where they're interrelated in many different ways. It's, it's not 
it doesn't fit into that sort of very atomistic paradigm. And the same with neuroscience, we're actually realizing. Yeah, well, it's they, they uh, always, when you make a great step forward, I, I great believe in inversion, turn a thing upside down. Oh, okay. In problem solving, that often works very well. And this is the thing, the core problem with modern science um, and indeed cosmology is that we're looking at it upside down. So uh, consciousness is not, in fact, an emergent property of the brain or the mind, wherever that resides. It's the other way up. So everything in the universe stems from consciousness. Consciousness in some way is the one thing that there is, the one thing, in fact, the only thing we can say we definitely know is so. I could, you could easily be a hologram or a matrix. I could be dreaming, I could be drunk, but I know I'm conscious. I know I'm here, as in Descartes. I think, therefore I am. I know that's the only thing I can say is certain. Even this, this could be, you know, I could be in some amazing new piece of te technology where I can feel things. So once you say that, that's why, and that's where ideas come from. Why, when you're in the zone, do you work better? Why do you achieve more? Because it's not about you, it's about consciousness, and that's the entirety of everything. And yet it's only one thing, and it has, it's nowhere. It, it doesn't now, here, it hasn't, it's not a place, it's not a thing, it doesn't weigh anything. It's just, you know, there's a great QI fact that present internet weighs about as much as a small banana. <laughs> and consciousness weighs, is even more gossamery than that. And when you flip it upside down, it explains a lot of things. So how do you explain that? The, the internet as in all of the, all of the electrons that make up the internet? I guess, about, yeah. About a banana's a worth. Banana. Um, and it's also very interesting. The, I've, I've hold, held these views for about 25 years, that consciousness is the ground of being. And I read it in a book, somebody's biography, before I realized it's a core principle of Hinduism. Right. But it helps, it's helped me an enormous amount, and it's all coming back to, it's, it, mm. this is the thing now, isn't it? So you've got panpsychism, you've got cosmopsychism. Pantheism. Yeah, you've got the... Panentheism. Uh, panentheism. Yeah, do you know Ber Bernardo Castrop? Have you come yes. across him? We've, we've had him on. He's yeah. very interesting. Um, and the thing is, is he, what's his book called? Um, it's not called materialism is bullshit, but something materialism, materialism is baloney, isn't it, or something like something that? Something like that. So Bernardo Kastrup is a fascinating character because he's a scientist at CERN, the, the particle accelerator. So in a way, he's like part of the, the high priest of the yeah. biggest scientific experiment ever created. But he's an idealist. He believes fundamentally that mind is the only thing that exists. Like Plato, yeah. and and so do I. And I think. Yeah. And there's a string of scientists all through history that have thought the same thing. Um, Arthur Eddington used to say that. And in fact, it's it's almost it's very very common among physicists, the the, the overlaps between the the twenties physicists and like Niels Bohr, David Bohm. Yeah. I think was a little bit after that, but the overlaps and Heisenberg and the overlaps between the the twenties originators and, and um, pioneers and mist, sort of a kind of mysticism because what they realize is when they tried to measure the smallest thing, they realized they were in relation with it. There was not, the, it kind of challenged the paradigm that it's out there and can be measured and realize, oh no, we're in relation with it. It is, we're changing it by measuring it. There is a kind of unity that we're picking up um, that, that should have challenged the kind of well, it's, it's, it's fascinating you say that because I totally get that. All those great physicists, you know, who are supposedly interested in matter, whatever that is, which we don't know, we just know it's a kind of energy. Mm. So This uh, is very reminiscent of um, Ian McGilchrist's new book, okay. where his, he says, we're asking the wrong question if we say, what is mind? It's like, we don't know what, we don't know what matter is. Really? Yeah. So, but all of them, Schrodinger, um, Dirac, uh, Einstein, um, uh, Niels Bohr, um, Max Planck, all of them started off as being, as it were, materialists and so interested in how the mechanism went. They all ended up being mystics, essentially, because at the end of their lives, they think, well, you know, Schrodinger wrote a book called What is Life? You know, and, 
and the smarter they are, the more likely they are to become. And having done all this work and made these discoveries, we still don't know. We still are not at first base. But the idea that there is only one conscious thing of which we're all an excrescence, as it were, explains an awful lot of things. But more interestingly, it provides you a model of how to behave because you're only really a, pro we're both a projection of something much bigger than us, which is immaterial. And we should get on because we are, we belong to the same, not just the same tribe. We're, we're part of the one thing. We're just a, you know, Alan Watts used to say, it's like God, uh, you know, uh, created this as a sort of game so that he could know himself and watch the interplay of himself. Mm. I don't know whether that's, that's true or not, but it's such a great image. Mm. Um, and also, you know, it's a very comforting thing when people have died because I, again, it's something my, as it were, religious cosmology is that it's a bit like whatever it is, the law of conservation of matter. I think it's um, a matter can neither be created nor destroyed. That's a core principle of physics. And as you say, we don't know what matter is. I would say it's even more true of mind. Mind cannot be created or destroyed. It's always there. It's just with matter, you can't destroy anything material. You can only make it change state. So you can destroy a piece of material, but the atoms will still be there or the electrons or the ions or whatever. And similarly, so that the mind is always going to be there. There's just a, there's a temporary period where we appear to be physical and then we disappear again. So, and these are the things where you, it leaves people like me, well, if there are, I hope there's nobody like me, but in a kind of limbo because I love science. You know, I only became interested in my 40s. I absolutely love it, but it doesn't help me get through Thursday. It doesn't matter how, how clever you are in the, the lab, how are you going to get on with your difficult six-year-old? Or how come you're on your third marriage? You know, where's the science in that? That doesn't seem very logical. Because however good we may be at the, the doing the spreadsheets and the science at work, we're still very inadequate as human beings, most of us. And I, I'm fascinated to know where that is. Why people who could be technically clever can be hopeless running their own life and that's the thing that interests me is how how do you how do we find ways for one another to help each other to be i don't think it's about happiness i think it's about meaningful having a more meaningful existence where we're not confused and frightened and angry and uh, full of you know doubt and um pretending we're something we're not and all those absurd things yeah there's a kind of relatedness to wisdom there that Intelligence does not equate to wisdom, because wisdom is a, about how we live our lives. Well, that's a thing. I've thought a lot about intelligence and wisdom over the years, and here's a thing. It's possible to be a very intelligent and conventionally very bad person. You know, lots of dictators are highly intelligent, or at least highly cunning. It's not possible to be wise and to be a bad person. I put that to you. So that's what's different about wisdom. Wisdom is, is of itself a good thing. And intelligence can be put to all sorts of horrific uses. And again, I don't, it's something that I used to really value, that I've got a high IQ or I don't know how high. They wouldn't tell me at school. I was the only kid in the school. They wouldn't tell me what my IQ was. So it's either very low or it's very high. So, And you sort of think, Intelligence, and that isn't. It's, intelligence is just something that you, you, you're given to start with. It's like saying, I'm very tall, and therefore you can't take credit for being tall, you know, for being naturally athletic or having big hands or anything. Same with intelligence. But wisdom takes effort. And if you find wisdom, it's probably been, you know, absolute agony for a long, long time, and that, that's fine. You can, but, of course, wise people don't take credit for that either. They go... How lucky am I that I know a few things that I can help other people with? I long for the day, David. I wonder if um, you might talk a bit about your sort of experience in the comedy world. Like, what, Sure. Um, do you think that this is, that comedy is related to 
any of these ideas? Um, I, I said, is, com is comedy a spiritual practice, I guess, is the question I'm reaching for. Um, hmm. what is comedy I mean, spiritual? again, I don't, I don't espouse that vocabulary. I'm not going to say that, you know, somebody said to me the other day, we had an Aussie friend to stay. He said, you're a very spiritual person. What? I don't even know what that means. I think it's, what, what I think is a good thing to be attentive to be awake, I think that's good. To be conscious, to be curious, those things are good. To be kind is a good thing. Um, but spiritual, I don't, what does that mean? That could mean anything. It could mean uh, some weird palmist, you know, who's obviously a complete fraud, or it could mean somebody who goes to church a lot and um, is pious, but actually is a shit at work. There's plenty of those. Um, but things that are of themselves good, you know, attentiveness, you know, attention to detail, um, being kind to p particularly people who don't deserve it, forgiving people, particularly people who don't deserve it, not minding when people criticize you. What's, what's that so babyish about that when people criticize and we get all hurt? Why? Why? I mean, either they're right, in which case fix yourself, or they're wrong, in which case, well, why did you say that? It's not true. But no, you'll get hurt. I mean, that is so peculiar to me you know as a father of three you know you you see it in small children all the time and you think that's just being a baby that's ridiculous but you're still going on now people of my age are still going you know they're getting affronted you've you've punctured my dignity how dare you say that to me do you know who i am and all that that is that is not good and it is not wise and it's not even intelligent it's just pathetic and that's the thing that's why i say we need a new vocabulary for how, how do we express what is worth doing? What is a meaningful life? What is a pointful life? And with comedy, you know, so I am the prof professor of ignorance because I refuse to accept several offers of a professor of comedy at various universities because I still don't know how it works. Um, so don't ask me. I know what's not funny and I know that's funny, but how you get, and I know how to help people get from one to the other, but why this is funny, I have no idea. And it's as big a question as why is there something and not nothing? Which is why it's not an irrelevant question to ask why is there something and not nothing, because these, these things, I call them the ordinary mysteries. They're the things that are most, most present with, but which, about which we know nothing. So consciousness, laughter, Music, art, um, this is absolutely strings and I can never remember them all, but they're all the things that we completely take for granted, love, are completely not understood. <coughs> um, so comedy, when I left university, I was such a bad lawyer that I thought, I, I, I don't want to do this, but in any case, I won't be any good at it. So I'm going to give myself a year and see if I can make it in comedy in some way as a performer or writer. <clears throat> and I was a little bit ashamed to begin with because all my other friends are, you know, doctors and, you know, bankers and lawyers and all that were proper jobs. And they all started to have, you know, nice cars. And, and I thought I'm just arsing around, having fun. I'm doing what I used to do for fun, you know, on Saturdays, trying to make people laugh. But over time, you think, apart from being a doctor, making people laugh for a living, I think it's a very good thing to do. It's a, it's a, it's a do no harm thing, like doctors, you know, say in the Hippocratic Oath. It's, a, it's just objectively good. If you can make a lot of people laugh a lot, that's a good thing. And so in that sense, rather than say, are you spiritual? I say, you know, are you on the right path? Let's say, so I'm pretty interested in Taoism. <clears throat> and Taoism is not at all moralistic. It says basically there is the Tao, consciousness. There is the, 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 the inalienable, the, what do they call it in ancient Greece? The, what did Heraclitus call it? The irreducible? Uh, it's, no, it's got it's a, two syllables. Anyway, it's a very old idea. There's this one thing, the principle of the universe, that is not made of anything but is eternally there, the eternal Tao. Okay, so let's say it's that, and then the Tao became one, and one became two, and the 
two became three, and three became the 10,000 things. So out of nothing, you have everything, essentially. That's the first verse. And the Tao doesn't say, if you do this, you'll go to hell. If you do this, you'll go to heaven. It goes, what the, the enlightened man does this. You know, if you do this, it's a bit like cooking a small fish. This will happen. If you do that, then this will happen. It's, it says, it's much more like a workshop manual, a set of advising things, you know, to stay on the path. In other words, to lead an optimal useful, meaningful life for you and all those around you. These are the things how the, the sage is sometimes called, or the enlightened person or whatever. This is how they behave. So that, that's the thing. That's why I can't really belong to a religion, because you can see there are, in all religions, there are wonderful people and there are terrible people and there are lots of people in the middle. It's, the religion's got nothing to do with it. It's about this is, you know, it's you and me is what counts. And religions tend, in terms of public religions, they tend to be all about how you behave in terms of what you wear, how, whether you sing or not, you know, what, what you, ritual, that kind of thing. Mm. Whereas if, if you know, the, in, in things like Taoism or Stoic philosophy, for example, it's much more about how about trying it like this? I think it'll go better for you if you are kind to people all the time. Why? Because the nicer you are to people, you'll find they'll be nice back. I can sign up to that kind of, you know, spiritual belief, but it doesn't really, it doesn't sound like spirituality, does it? It sounds like, it's more like, sense. yeah, carpentry. It's like, well, and that's my, you know, again, I don't, I don't have a religion, but if I did, it would be stuff like that. It's simple. Why be altruistic? Well, because you'll help a lot of people out who are in trouble and you'll feel great about it. And you do hear militant atheists saying, you see, I told you, it's just a form of selfishness. Mm -hmm. It's being in harmony with the structure of the universe of which we're not aware is, be kind, you'll find things will go well. It might take a few years as the universe tries to beat you up for breaking the rules and behaving like a good person. Yes, yeah, so I'm someone who worked in the media for quite a long time and got kind of really interested in what are the pressure points for kind of feeling the domination of kind of the new atheist, kind of rationalist, reductionist thing that we've both been talking about, both been thinking about, and feeling like it's such a limited worldview and there's there's so much more interesting ways of looking at the world and kind of feeling that that cultural stranglehold certain programs wouldn't get commissioned because they would they would be kind of shot down by the Dawkins types and then get gradually getting a sense that that kind of space was opening up a little bit more there's a more openness to religious themes there's more openness to spirituality for want of a better word um, where do you sense that the kind of the cultural conversation is at at the moment? Do you sort of sense that things are shifting? Yes, I think we're on the cusp of a paradigm shift. And I think unless we are, we're, we're all doomed. You know, if we go on along the materialist line, you can see that that's why we have climate change, because people want more stuff. They want the economies to grow. People want more things. And that's what happened to me in my crisis. I realized that I had all the things and I needed to go on a different path now. So if I have a religion to sign up to, it's immaterialism. So I'm an immaterialist. I think the things that aren't made of things are more important than the things that are made of things. So love, comedy, you know, um, art, those things, being in the zone, uh, meditation, consciousness, these things, they are what they are what is, and all the other stuff is, I'm with the Hindus and there's Maya, the great illusion. You know, we are in the matrix. We are in a, in a massively well, uh, technically well-made, but insane movie that doesn't make any sense. And who hasn't felt that? You know, my life doesn't make any sense. Why did this happen? You know, every time you go to a funeral, why them? Why this? You know, and it's because the, this is the drama in which we find ourselves, in which the paradox is, it's not about you, kid. You know, you are nothing. When you've ever flown in a plane and you see, as you take off from Heathrow, the houses get smaller and smaller, and in every one of those now little tiny dice is a family with feelings and lives and tragedies and comedies going on all the time. 
So it's definitely not about you, the universe. We're, but yet we all think it is. We think we're the center of the sat-nav, don't we? That and Why is it not doing what I want it to? Why is it not giving me things? Yeah, because it's not about you. But yet the paradox is it's all about you. There is, you only got one job. You had just one job. You turn up here as a baby. You're supposed to fix yourself, mate. That's what you're meant to do. You only had to blow the bloody doors off. You know, that's the thing. And so the, the other side of it is it's all about you. And a, a very good way to live is to think you are the only actor in the drama. If you don't do it properly, it's all going go to you know, go to pieces. That's your job. And William Woolard, who used to be a scientist and became a Buddhist and is a brilliant talker about Buddhism, says the thing about any philosophy or religion is it doesn't have to be true, but it has to be effective for you. And so that works for me is like I've discovered by dint of QI research is that if a frog or a pigeon or a grain of barley is that interesting, a person's many times more interesting. So one of the great pleasures of my life is to talk to everybody, people at bus stops, people in shops, taxi drivers. And I have these fantastic conversations and sometimes last, you know, an hour, often cab driver will turn the meter off and say, and we'll keep talking because it's so great when you make that human connection. And what happens when you're talking to somebody else in that depth? You're in the zone. You forget you. You forget about you. You're so busy relating and empathizing with the other person. And very often the most delightful thing is when that person is politically completely opposed to you or voted the other way in Brexit, you know, and you find that there's still a human being you know, who can talk passionately about their daughter's amazing ballet or, you know, uh, rugby games or something. And that's what we should be doing. And it's in, in a way, could, because, I, you know, in my crisis, I read all the books about enlightenment. Oh, my goodness, I wanted to be enlightened. It's just such a waste of time wanting to be enlightened. It's like wanting to be happy. The thing is, it's be here now and try and be a better person. It's that simple, honestly. Be nice. Uh, that's an extraordinarily effective thing. Mm. Be nice and do something which you really care about. Mm. And that's enough, really. It, uh, all the kitchen extensions and the yachts and all that caboodle is, is completely irrelevant because we only, you know, again, whether we only get one go or we're going to come back m many thousands of times reincarnated to something else, it's, it's irrelevant. I mean, one of my... Um, sort of mantras is, is, is we only uh, we have many lives but only this one counts so it's it's irrelevant because you won't remember you know who you were in your last incarnation and or you won't know who's you're going to be so there is only now I mean in the and these these things that are now count as mystical baloney or you know that awful word pseudoscience you know, everything's pseudoscience until somebody proves that it works, you know, or rather, as we know, science doesn't prove anything. It only tries to disprove things and the things that it cannot disprove. It, uh, uh, it, it we, is what we call science. I mean, for example, one thing that obsesses me is telepathy. So I'm a little bit telepathic and I know this because there's an Internet um, site called GotSci run by a brilliant guy in California. That all the evidence is there is telepathy. They've done loads of studies on it. There's just no doubt about it. But science doesn't know how to deal with it because it's not it's not a thing. The, the communications method, how can one mind understand another? Well, that's what we thought about radio waves before they, they work them out. They will work it out. They will work out what's going on. Mm. And again, it's an immaterialist thing. Telepathy is... Why? Just because it hasn't, you know, the... It hasn't got into the scientific literature where it's not in nature or something. Why do you have to rule out something just because it hasn't been disproven or proven or whatever? It's it. So, yeah, the shift, because the crucial thing is everybody in the world forever has spent the, most of their lives looking for whose fault it is. Who did this? You know, it's them over there. It's the people who live the other side of the mountain or it's the Nazis or it's the... <laughs> you know, the terrorists, whatever. And and we think 
all of us in our lives are trying to change something very small, whether it's painting a door because it's your job to, or whether it's you know trying to change world politics. It's all kind of futile. That the only thing that needs to be changed is human nature, which is extraordinarily enduring. You know, empires come and go, and the same people run them. You know, the same flawed angry, you know, again, this binary thing that are you so interested that we are binary as a as a species. There's the the little yappy person who who is all the trouble and there's the big, open, creative, calm thing that's connected to something much larger than us, the consciousness thing. And uh, that's what we need to do. More of that and less of the materialist stuff. John, it's always a pleasure and yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. So we release videos on YouTube around once a week, and you can also find all these interviews and conversations on the Rebel Wisdom podcast feed. And we're also doing deep dive written newsletters on Substack. Check out the link in the show notes and please sign up there, and you'll get everything sent direct to your inbox, including special previews, extra content for subscribers, and also you can join the conversation that we're hosting on Substack. We've also recently launched a big project called the Sense Making Companion. It's split into three parts with videos, workbooks, and much more, and it's completely free. Again, check out the link in the show notes and hope to see you soon.